Hey, good morning. You know, less than one year after I became a Christian, God took me on this wild ride where I found myself sitting 300 miles from home in the office at St. Louis Christian College. As I sat there, they told me that I would be on academic probation for my first semester because my SAT scores were below average. Now, I understood this. I know that I didn't try in high school when I was lost, and so I'd just become a Christian, had a little bit more added motivation to work hard and succeed for the glory of God. And so I was fine with that. I understood that it was just a, a safety precaution to make sure that I stayed on track academically. But over the next four years, years, I watched as several students with high SAT, high ACT scores, and high IQ sadly failed out of school. And that's when I realized that natural intelligence or even knowledge is not enough to succeed in life. It truly takes godly wisdom. See, wisdom is when knowledge meets hard work and godly common sense. And one thing I've always been a big fan of, and you guys know this if you've ever heard one of my messages, but I've always loved quotes because quotes have a way of making us look at things through a different perspective. They cause us to look through different lenses than we normally look through. And in particular, I've always loved different proverbs from around the world. And so I put together for you a top 10 list of global proverbs. Some are serious, some are funny, but all of them have wisdom in them. And guys, we're going to do this top 10 style, just like David Letterman used to do back in the day. So here goes, top 10 global proverbs. Okay, first one. Number 10, an English proverb all that glitters is not gold, an empty purse frightens away friends. Now that's the truth there. Number nine, an African proverb. By persevering, the egg walks on legs. Very true. Number eight, a Jewish proverb. If the rich could hire the poor to die for them, the poor would make a very nice living. Very true, but kind of weird. Number seven, a Chinese proverb. Wise men may not be learned. Learned men may not be wise. We're going to talk about that today. Number six, a Dutch proverb from my friend Robert Poldervart from Rush County, but ultimately from Holland. Here's what the Dutch proverb says. The water isn't worth the cabbage. Number five, a Mexican proverb. The house does not rest upon the ground but upon a woman. Number four, Egyptian proverb, a monkey is a gazelle in its mother's eyes. Number three, a Russian proverb, do not dig a hole for somebody else that you yourself will fall into. I think we've all done that before, right? Number two, an Arab proverb, when you shoot an arrow of truth, dip its point in honey. Very wise. And number one, all the way from the great state of Indiana, our home state that we love, it says this, someone who finds fault hears, the fox is the finder, the stink lies behind her. Man, that's got Indiana written all over it. Maybe not as wise as the others, but that's us, okay? Top 10 list is done. All right, David Letterman style. Now, guys, welcome back here to the seventh week of our series that is all about growing in spiritual maturity, becoming the men and women of God that we're called to be, becoming those people who truly seek the heart of God with everything that we are. James says that as believers, we are to be mature and complete, not lacking anything. And then he goes on to tell us how we do that. And first, no matter what trials, no matter what temptations, no matter what struggles you face in this life, 
God's word must be our mirror by which we look at this world around us. And then James goes on to talk about what true faith looks like in a counterfeit world. Faith that does not demonstrate itself in love is useless. Faith that does not bear fruit is dead. Faith that does not control its tongue is hypocritical and has the potential to cause a massive amount of damage. And then today, James wants us to understand the difference between godly wisdom and worldly wisdom. Because sadly, James saw way too much worldly wisdom going on among those who claim to follow and love Jesus. And so he sets out to explain to the first century church, and we know that God uses that for us too today, he explains the difference between true wisdom and false wisdom. Do me a favor, grab your Bibles for me. Grab your Bibles, turn with me to James chapter 3. James chapter 3, give you just a second to get to James 3. We're going to start here in verse 13, and today we're going to do it a little different than we have been. We've kind of been walking through the passage just a little bit at a time. Today we're going to read the whole passage, James 3, 13 through 18, and then we're just going to kind of break it down as we go, okay? So James 3, let's start here in verse 13. Who is wise and understanding among you? Let them show it by their good life, by deeds done in humility that comes from wisdom. But if you harbor bitter envy and selfish ambition in your hearts, do not boast about it or deny the truth. Such wisdom does not come down from heaven, but it is earthly, unspiritual, demonic. For where you have envy and selfish ambition, there you find disorder and every evil practice. Verse 17, but the wisdom that comes from heaven is first of all pure, then peace-loving, considerate, submissive, full of mercy and good fruit, impartial and sincere. And then it says, verse 18, peacemakers who sow in peace reap a harvest of righteousness. So the first difference, and by the way, you can get your sermon outlines at fccgreensburg.com. You can download those. You can print them for yourself. Some of you, I know you because you're like me. You're big note takers. So that can be a blessing to help you remember even more of, of God's word today, of the message. So go ahead. If you got those, if you don't, no problem. First thing I want you to see, the difference between true and false wisdom is the difference in origin the difference in origin, where it comes from. James makes it clear that there are two different types of wisdom, one that comes from God and one that's man-made and comes from the world. And there's no question that worldly wisdom will usually bring you praise from the world. Oftentimes it, it brings success and it's definitely the easier path to take most of the time. But here's the thing about when you give your heart to Jesus. You're saying no to making this life all about selfish gain, about making it about you, and you're running after the things of this world. You're saying no to running after the things of this world. And you're saying yes to laying your will aside and living out God's will and being molded daily into the image of Jesus Christ, looking more like him, serving him, loving him with everything you are. See, in the world's eyes, things like sacrificing time to serve God, things like giving a tithe back to the Lord makes no sense. Things like giving up a week of vacation to go to a, a conference with the youth group or to do a missions trip, those things make no sense to the world. But the good news is we don't answer to the world, do we? The good news is that, that we answer to our God, to our Savior. I won't stand before you when my days are done, and you won't stand before me, but we will both stand before Jesus. And our goal must be to glorify Him and store up our treasures in heaven. Guys, and that starts by immersing our hearts in the word of truth that has changed billions of lives throughout the years. Solomon, the wisest man to ever live, according to the Bible, puts it this way in Proverbs 9, verse 10. He says, the fear of the Lord. Let me stop there for a second. Uh, if you're not real familiar with this phrase, the fear of the Lord, it's all throughout scripture, and it would be real easy to misunderstand this. It doesn't mean that I have this, this 
trepidation of my God that I'm, I'm scared that every time I mess up, he's going to throw a lightning bolt down at me or he's going to ruin my life in some way that I just walk around just scared of this evil, mean God. That's not what this means. The fear of the Lord first is this healthy respect for our God who is awesome in power, who created everything out of nothing, who is majestic and righteous. And I realize that he is God and he is awesome in power and I am not. And so I have this healthy respect in all for how awesome my God is, while also realizing that he loves me and that he gave his life on the cross for you and for me that, so that we could be forgiven and we could walk in his hope every day on this earth and for eternity. That's the fear of the Lord, this healthy respect and awe for our God. So it says in Proverbs 9:10, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom and knowledge of the Holy One is understanding. You know, this book right here is like no other book that's ever been written because this book is God breathed, just like 2 Timothy 3 teaches us. And I love what Charles Spurgeon said many years ago. He said, it is an honor to believe what the lips of Jesus taught. I had sooner be a fool with Christ than a wise man with the philosophers. I wonder how many of you listening at home today know what the word hermeneutics means. Now, if your answer is no, don't feel bad about that. Honestly, I didn't know either until I had to take a class called Hermeneutics 101 in Bible college. And it's just a big word for how to properly interpret scripture. It's the study of how to study the Bible. And we all know that there have been many occults started here in this world by people who rip one piece of scripture out of context make it say what they want, build a whole theology around one little passage. And one thing that I was taught in class, as they taught me all these very valuable things I need to understand when looking at God's word that have helped me tremendously. But one thing they taught me is you don't just rip a passage out, but if you, the best way to interpret scripture is by putting it next to other Bible passages, by understanding that concept as it teaches throughout the word of God. And here's how the apostle Paul puts it in 1 Corinthians 1, 18 through 20. And I'm gonna read this from the New Living Translation, 1 Corinthians 1, verses 18 through 20. The apostle Paul said, the message of the cross is foolish to those who are headed for destruction, but we who are being saved know it is the very power of God. As scriptures say, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise and discard the intelligence of the intelligent. Verse 20. So where does this leave the philosophers, the scholars, the world's brilliant debaters? God's word has made the wisdom of this world look foolish. And so uh, one thing that, that legend teaches us is that the, a very proud young man came up one day to a the apparently muscular philosopher Socrates. And he said, Oh, great Socrates, I come to you for wisdom. Now, these are Socrates' words here, but Socrates said, I can recognize a pompous numbskull when I see one. So he led the young man through the streets to the sea and then kind of chest deep in the water. And then he said to the young man, Now tell me, what do you want? Wisdom the young man said with this kind of uh, cocky smile on his face. And so Socrates put his hands on his shoulders and he pushed him under the water for 30 seconds. And then he let him up. What do you want? He asked him. Wisdom. The young man sputtered. Socrates pushed him under the water again, this time for about 40 seconds. And then he let him up and he said, what do you want? Kind of gasping for air this time. The man finally was able to say, Wisdom, O oh wise and wonderful Socrates. Well, once again, he jammed him under the water, but this time he didn't let him up for almost a minute. And then he said, tell me, what do you want? Air, the young man screamed, I need air. And that's when this teacher said, hey, when you want wisdom as you just wanted air, then you'll find wisdom. 
And we know where we find wisdom at, right? James chapter 1, verse 5 says, If any of you lacks wisdom, he needs to ask God who gives it generously. See, true wisdom begins not with the world's point of view on things, because those things are changing every few years. Have you noticed that most of us in our lifetime, if, if we're more than 10, 15 years old, probably, we, we've seen, or at least over the last 20 or 30 years, especially over the last 50 or 60 years, we have seen things that were considered moral and right and true completely change and now those things supposedly are not moral and right and true. So we don't determine truth by the world that's always changing and always shifting, but true wisdom is found in the eternal word of God and by seeking wisdom through prayer. And by the way, the word of God and the Holy Spirit's leading through prayer will always match up if it's from the Lord. So first, when it comes to wisdom, there's a big difference in origin. Second, there's a difference in operations, a difference in operations. We see this in verses 13 and 14 here in James chapter 3 and also verse 17. Guys, there's a big difference in how godly and worldly wisdom present themselves. And if you're around someone enough, you'll be able to see this. And James gives us four different character traits, not of godly wisdom, but of worldly wisdom. So the first one, and you'll see this here, is jealous. Worldly wisdom is jealous. It is envious. Worldly wisdom is never satisfied with where they are because, listen, it, it, there's jealousy there. There's always somebody else who maybe looks better, who has more money, who has nicer things, who's smarter, who's more respected, whatever. Worldly wisdom is all about one-upping the Joneses. And honestly, all you have to do is turn on the TV and look at the type of people that our society constantly celebrates and admires, even though so many of them are terrible role models and honestly don't walk in the joy and the peace that we as followers of Jesus are invited to walk in. And then second, James tells us that selfishness is another common character trait of this world. Worldly wisdom says that it's all about you. It's all about me. Take care of yourself. It's all about good old number one. It's all about what you want, what you think. And sadly, James is seeing this mindset infiltrate the church, just like we see it too. And instead of saying, okay, what is our mission from Jesus? And how can we go about that in a godly way? These people were more worried about things like control and self-gain and family prestige. Tell me if you've ever heard that before, right? That is a recipe for an ungodly Christian and an unhealthy church because it's always about Jesus and it's always about the kingdom of God and that can never change. Third, James says that worldly wisdom is boastful, boastful. And what this comes down to is, is who gets the credit when things go well. Is it us or is it Jesus? Is it, hey, look at me, maybe even subtle ways of doing that. Look at all I've accomplished. Or as a church, are we all about that old quote by D.T. Niles that says, listen, I'm just one beggar telling another beggar where to find food. Because of the grace of God in my life, that I've done nothing to earn or deserve that I can't earn, because of the grace of God, I am compelled to be used as his hands and his feet in this world. And if that means that things are going well, then give God the glory and let's keep building the kingdom of God. Now, fourth, worldly wisdom is deceitful. Deceitful. And all this word means is it is misrepresenting. It is concealing the truth for personal gain. And there's no question that we live in a society that is all about getting to the top by whatever means necessary. And James even warns churches, hey, don't act this way because it doesn't honor God. He's basically saying that in all things, we have to show integrity. So things like jealousy, selfishness, boasting, deceit, those are not characteristics of true wisdom. That's what worldly wisdom looks like. But let's talk about this. Let's talk about what true and godly wisdom looks like. And listen, from our passage here, I promise I'm going to go quickly because if you noticed, there's quite a list uh, of what true godly wisdom looks like. 
And the first thing I want you to see is humility. Humility. David Wilkerson defined humility pretty good. He said, a humble person is not one who thinks little of himself, who hangs his head and says, I'm nothing. Rather, he is one who depends wholly on the Lord in everything, in every circumstance. And let me add, a humble person realizes he's only somebody, she's only somebody because of what God says about us, because of the grace of God. Second character trait of wisdom is purity. Purity. It's a word that we don't talk about enough anymore in church. The word is purity. A wise person isn't just someone who holds a title, who can talk theology, who can quote a bunch of Bible passages. But listen, there's someone who seeks to live a life that honors and pleases Jesus Christ, especially when no one else is around. I like how D.L. Moody put this years ago, the famous evangelist. He said, character is what a man is in the dark. Ain't that the truth there? Third, James says a wise person is one who is peace loving, who is peace loving. Guys, we're going to hit this one big time next week because our passage covers this. But we're talking about someone who's not looking for a fight, who's not looking for competition, who's not looking to always be offended, but who chooses peace as often as possible. And that doesn't mean that there aren't some hills that are worth dying on, but it's having the wisdom to know what hills are worth dying on and where there needs to be peace and unity and love, which are some of the things that Jesus talked about the very most. Fourth, wisdom is shown through being considerate, through being considerate. One thing I believe with all my heart is that it's the little things in life that you don't even have to do, that no one would even notice if you didn't do them. It's those things that truly make all the difference. Someone who is wise is always attentive. They're always considerate and they're looking out for others and looking for an opportunity to bless someone, to make them feel loved, to make them feel appreciated. Next, one trait that we don't often put with wisdom, but it's very true, and and James talks about it here, is being submissive. Being submissive. Now, guys, all of us kind of cringe at that word because we know that we all struggle with it. This is not popular in our culture. We've talked about this one before. But the reality is in life, there are always going to be people in authority over you. Whether it's at work, whether it's at home, whether it's at church, wherever. And one area that I think all of us have probably struggled with at one time or another is rebelliousness. Rebelliousness. And it comes so naturally, doesn't it? And yet being submissive to authority to godly authority is so important to our God. And James' point here is not to say you have to give up or compromise your godly convictions in order to be submissive, but a wise person knows how to listen, number one, and show respect to those in authority. They know how to disagree without being disagreeable. And to be 100% real with you here, this is one area that I'm telling you, God has worked on me a ton over the last 10 or 15 years, and I am just so thankful that I've grown as much as I have, although I still have a ways to grow, and I'm thankful that he shows grace. Sixth, wisdom is shown when you're merciful, when you're merciful. James is speaking to churches of people just like us who have been transformed by the grace and the mercy of God. And he's saying, how in the world can you not be a people of mercy when that's the only thing that sets you free on this earth and will be your ticket into heaven? See, God's mercy and God's grace is the very thing by which you and I stand today in the hope of Christ. A life of wisdom is always full of mercy. Next, wisdom is impartial. Wisdom is impartial. We talked about this a few weeks back, that God's church cannot show favoritism based on anything, money, looks, race, or anything else, okay? And then last, James says that true wisdom is, is always sincere. The opposite of the word sincere is the word hypocrite. And I love the word picture that the Greek uses here to describe this word. Hypocrite was a word that was used in acting. And so it's this picture of a person wearing a mask and pretending to be someone that they're not. And then sincerity is the opposite of that. It's being real. It's being honest, first with God, 
and then being genuine with others and keeping your word. You know, there really is a big difference between worldly wisdom and true godly wisdom, not in, in, in just where they come from, but also in how they operate. And then third, I want you to see the difference in outcome. The difference in outcome. And this comes from verses 16 and 18. So turn back with me here, just a little refresher. It's been a few minutes since we read that passage here. James 3, I'm going to read verse 16 and then uh, jump one verse to verse 18. For where you have envy and selfish ambition, there you find disorder in every evil practice. Verse 18, peacemakers who sow in peace reap a harvest of righteousness. So very simple, very simple here. James says those that act in worldly wisdom that is based only upon man, not in the word of God, will find chaos and they will reap what they've sown. There will be jealousy, there will be selfishness, there will be boasting, and there will be deceit. There will be a pattern of chaos. All you have to do is step back and look at the outcome because it's chaos and it's trouble. And then he tells us that true wisdom straight from God brings blessings. Alexander Gregolia had come to America from Soviet Georgia. He learned English. He earned three, not one, not two, but three doctoral degrees and he became a successful professor at the University of Pennsylvania. Despite his achievements, he had a misery in his heart that he just couldn't get rid of. One day, while he was getting a shoe shine from a man uh, that he was pretty sure was uneducated, he noticed that this boot black went about his work with a sense of joy. He was scrubbing and buffing and smiling and talking and singing. And finally, Dr. Gagolia could take it no longer. He said in his thick accent, why are you always so happy? And by the way, that was terrible. It sounded more like Arnold Schwarzenegger, I think. But, but looking up, the boot black paused and he said, listen, Jesus loves me. He died so God could forgive my badness. He makes me happy. The professor snapped his newspaper back in front of his face because that was not the answer he was looking for. And then the boot black went back to work. Dr. Gregolia never forgot about that encounter and those words from that man, and they eventually led him to the foot of the cross where he found hope in Jesus. He later became a professor of anthropology at Wheaton College, and he taught, among other students, a young student named Billy Graham. See, here's what I want you to see today. Godly and true wisdom shows itself in righteousness and a joy that this world cannot understand. But let me leave you with wisdom from Proverbs 3, verse 13. It says, blessed are those who find wisdom, those who gain understanding. Knowledge is not necessarily the answer, although it's not evil. Knowledge is not the answer. Godly and true wisdom is. Straight from the word of God and from the Holy Spirit's leading. Pray with Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word today. We thank you for how you speak right into our lives. And Father, I just pray that, that you will help us to walk not in worldly wisdom, not in the things of this world and, and, and seeking after the, the approval of men, but help us to walk in your wisdom every single day. Help us to have the fruit that true wisdom brings that we talked about today. God, we just thank you for your word we thank you for how you've spoken to us today, and may we always be mindful that we are your body, we are your bride, and we are the light of this world. You call us to be the light of this world for you. And so, Father, help us as we go out into this world to shine brightly for you and help us to truly make a difference for the kingdom of God. It's all about you, Father, and we give you our hearts today, and we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.